Hey, welcome back to Wall Street Silver. I have an all-star panel today. I have Jack from Nobody Special Finance and Travis from, where are you from again? Economic uh, Ninja, know, yeah. I don't know who Travis is, the yeah. Economic Ninja. Economic, is California. We'll, we'll let it out your name because I know that's your secret identity. Don't worry about Thank that. Thank you. Actually, we're not gonna edit it out. Oh, All great. right. <laughs> so we're here to talk about real estate the housing market's looking like it's about to flip at the wrong direction and what's causing it and what are the possible impacts longer term and how it all ties into silver and gold and precious metals so um travis what is it your 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 channel's really known for real estate uh real estate and lumber that's really where your channel took off uh yeah. what are you seeing right now so First off, I'm a real estate agent. Uh, I'm not practicing right now, to be honest with you. I quit back in December because I got so uh, ticked off with the industry because it was sell, sell, sell. And uh, I was actually busy working with the banks to get all of their uh, REO listings because I, I see the, the pressure building and I, I knew that this was not going to last forever, like exactly what happened in 08. And uh, from my investing background, I knew that there would be a day where this turned and it looks like it just recently did. And uh, what I'm citing as the top of the market is actually a, a pivotal change in, in emotion, in perception of what real estate is and how much it's worth. We've seen a, a last of the year being just absolute crazy town with uh, homes being bought up by, um, I, I honestly call it the dumb money at the end of the cycle and a lot of hedge funds too, which I guess after 2008, we could call the dumb money as well. Um, what happened is in June, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the metrics changed where uh, we were talking about I'm totally blown up. pending home sales. In pending June home June. sales. Thank you. Yeah, I totally screwed that up. The pending home sales were supposed to come in at a positive, uh, approximately what, what two low 2% uh, tile range. And what we actually saw was a cratering of pending home sales uh, down around negative six and a half percent, if my memory serves me right. And what's happening right now is it's starting to hit a Google and, and the news like crazy. Uh, I was I was talking earlier that if I did a video that if you if you uh, Google, you know, real estate crash and hit the news uh, header, you'll see just story after story in the last five or six days of the crashes here. Get ready. Tighten your belts. Um, and this, what they're talking about isn't even necessarily talking about the impending uh, foreclosure uh, debacle and the uh, eviction moratorium. Yeah, so, um, you know, here's an example of what you were just talking about. Uh, these articles are starting to appear on Motley, Motley Fool uh, and a few others that we've been seeing. And is it, what do you think are the root causes of this? Is it just is money tightening up? What, it, what we're, you know, Lee, yeah, Lee, so, Lee, so that's Lee. a great question. Uh, so we have two different types of buyers in this market. And it sounds funny because people say to me all the time, well, this is nothing like 2008. And I said, you're actually right. It's hundred percent worse than 2008 because we have two types of buyers. We have retail buyers and then we have institutions. And right now, institutions are buying up homes left and right. Now uh, I want to preface that with uh, we have very extremely low real estate inventories available for sale. We have been in that boat since uh, early 2020, where um, normally, let's say, uh, in a normal market, uh, Department of Real Estate would at, say nationwide, we'd have anywhere between 1.6 and 1.8 million homes for sale um, in a given uh, time period. And we've seen it get down to as low as 1.1 million uh, available homes for sale. Okay, so whenever there's low inventory and there's a, a pool of buyers, whether they be large or small, if that uh, inventory is smaller than the pool of buyers, we're going to see a demand in house. We're going to see sales skyrocket. We're going to see prices go into bidding wars, things like that. We also have uh, institutions buying up homes, which is very dangerous because in a low yield environment, uh, institutions are starved for yield. So they're running out right now, taking capital putting it into the real estate market and then renting out the homes, or in some cases like Zillow, they're literally flipping the homes, okay? This leads to a very dangerous environment of bidding wars, price escalation, and a, uh, a, a not a natural environment, okay? So uh, the one thing that's happening is retail buyers are completely frustrated and burnt out. The other thing that we're gonna see, and I believe we're seeing it right now, is uh, institutions are finding their max that they can pay for a home in any given location 
because they can't rent them for a good enough yield. So uh, I think really it all comes down to price at this point. Uh, Jack, do you have any, any thoughts on any of this? Well, let me uh, preface by establishing my real estate resume. Um, I've never been a realtor before. Um, no formal background and the uh, sum of my real estate experience is getting wiped out in 2006 when I bought my first home and lost every penny I made commercial fishing. So a uh, real estate expert, far from it. Um, I could just say what I see, all right? And I do see these numbers slowing. Um, I don't see a lot of numbers going down. I see a lot of slowing, which thank God it's slowing because I think we can all agree that the market of the past year is not sustainable. And the fact that just about anybody you talk to right now will tell you we're in a real estate bubble to me is one of the best indicators that it might not actually be a bubble or at least that it's got further to inflate. Because back in 2006, when I bought, everybody was saying, just buy it and sell it a month later. You'd be fine. Who cares if you make the payments? I don't hear that this time around. Mm -hmm. Not to be the cliche, this time is different. And when I look behind the numbers in just about every article I've seen that shows these slowing numbers, it's all on the supply side. I don't see the demand side. You know, the, the new home sales were down because the builders ran into trouble with material shortages. And, you know, D.R. Horton was saying they're slowing their pace of building to be in line with, or what was it? They were slowing their pace of selling to be in line with what they can build. Not that they can't sell more, but that they can't build fast enough to keep up with their selling. And that they're actually ramping up production. Was and some was, of that due to the lumber? I'm sorry to interrupt, but some of that was due to the lumber was skyrocketing for a while. And sort of they scaled back their building programs. Yep. And we saw that the last read we got in new home sales was June, right? So homes that were built in June were built with April and May lumber. Mm -hmm. So the last well, new home sales was peak lumber price. So we haven't really seen the effect of the crash in lumber in new home sales and what that's going to be like. So we may see an uptick in new homes construction now that lumber has come back down to earth. You know, there may be other shortages, washers and dryers, kitchen sinks. Who knows what the next thing that they're going to be un unable to get on a truck and get to Home Depot in time. Well, who don't, yeah, or get on a ship from China uh, because of supply chain. Uh, but there was, you know, a couple other things. The average listing is on the market for 17 days right now. Mm -hmm. That's lightning fast. I mean, homes, homes were on the market for six months, nine months during the last downturn. So I don't see a shortage of buyers and I wanna draw a distinction between price and affordability because those, those are two different things. What killed prices last time was homes became unaffordable. Not that the prices went so high, they did, the prices did go so high, but with all the adjustable rate mortgages kicking in and with Bernanke hiking over and over and over and over again, you had all those teaser rates expiring at the same time. And when they expired, those payments doubled and tripled and those homes became unaffordable overnight. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't really have that this time. There's no, they don't have those, you know, hey, really teaser low rates and then it jacks up to a higher. I, are, those, are those mortgages going on again? I haven't, I don't know. I haven't been paying attention. They're still out there. But are the, they? The, they, they're, they really crack down on it. And at least I don't see signs, you know, in front of banks, adjustable rate, you know, 30 year mortgages as low as this percent with an asterisk next to it. You know, I, I don't see what I saw the last time. Again, I didn't see it coming last time, but right. The fed still has the faucet on. And I, I hate to be that all roads lead to the fed, but as long as these rates stay where they are, and as long as they keep buying these mortgage backed securities, at least 40 billion a month, then the homes will stay relatively affordable. Now we are seeing numbers like, the percentage of these sales was 35% first time home buyers a few months ago. Now it's down to 31%. That could be people getting priced out, mm -hmm. right? Millennials cannot afford these price increases indefinitely, no matter what the interest rates are. Eventually they become unaffordable. Mm -hmm. But for most buyers, I don't see that yet. And we're seeing some of the data is getting skewed because most of the purchases are happening now on the higher end of the market. So it's driving up the average home sales price, even though these are bigger square, you know, more square footage, more bedrooms. 
let's, so let's I'm not on. saying it's we're done. You know, I'm not saying it isn't a bubble. I don't think it's burst yet. I, I don't think it's done running at least. I mean, I'm talking months, not years. I, I think we have a few more months still. Lee? Yeah, I, I'd actually like to follow up on what you're saying. I think it's a, a regional thing. Uh, I, I think it's going to vary greatly. If we have a second lockdown, everyone's talking about that now. It's kind of in, in the buzz of the uh, atmosphere. I think that's going to force people out of the cities again. I, I think we're going to have like a second wave of people moving. And at least in the New York area, I'm sure in Chicago and, and other major metro areas, people will flee the cities and we're going to see maybe a second jump up in home prices uh, in suburbia and you know surrounding areas. At the same time now, we have this whole eviction moratorium ending. So we're going to have a flood of renters on the market. But mm-hmm. so that's going to open up some some rental inventory. So it's, it's just I think there's just a lot of factors out there. We, we really don't know where we're at right now. Well, that leads into the next question I have. Let me share this one. The scheduled forbearance plan expirations. Um, This is something Travis has mentioned that we wanted to look at. Now, there's two different things here in play. There were, there's the the rental eviction moratorium, and then there's the mortgage forbearance plans. Now, Travis, one of those expired and one didn't. Can you explain what happened this past weekend? Yeah, it's actually quite uh, confusing right now. So um, the mortgage forbearance uh, has been kicked down the road a little bit longer as far as loans that are backed by the government. Um, Loans that are not backed by the government as of right now, uh, you have the green light to go in and start. uh, Banks can start actually uh, foreclosing on people. Uh, Now, with that being said, most of the loans out in the country right now are backed by the government. Uh, The actual... uh, eviction of renters right now that's state to state so uh that just that's all over the map right now what this chart's showing is at the peak and it's a massive peak of uh the forbearance uh plan expirations actually happens in september which i believe quite frankly is going to be like the the golden month for all kinds of of issues um but you know there is something that i want to explain and I, i think both gentlemen both uh, nailed it on the head. You know, what we're talking about right now is, is what I'm telling you guys about the real estate market is literally akin to 2005, 2005. I'm literally calling the top on a specific time point, about a 30 day period of the market. And I know that there's a lot of people that are saying, you know, hey, we still see high prices. Well, the thing is, is you only see high, but we're seeing slowing. And that's what's really important. Slowing is the first thing that happens when you start to see the downturn in real estate prices. When people are used to homes closing uh, in 17 days, and just to give you an idea, that same number was around in 2004. It is a hot market until it's not. When it stays a little, it starts to slow a little bit and people get jittery, people get nervous, and you start seeing more and more homes hitting the market, which are do- you're going to find out next month that the inventory of real estate has probably increased about 10% over last month. And what's going to happen is people start to lower their prices, they lower their prices. And I'm already seeing... Um, uh, prices being lowered where I live in California. And then something that Lee said was very interesting too. He said, it's just a regional thing. And you're absolutely correct. And I want to remind you again of 2005, it was the California and New York markets that started to take the hit. And then it took out the rest of the U.S. Um, the facts are, is that no doc loans are extremely alive and well right now today. If you ask any mortgage guy uh, worth a grain of salt, that's going to tell you the truth. Ask him, say, hey, how many people are doing no doc loans? And he'll say tons. And I'm getting that. Are, are those ninja, lo- ninja loans? What? Oh, yeah, ninja. ninja. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you'll call that a ninja, but not me. I get it. <laughs> I what, get was it. That, what was ninja? It stood for no income, no job, no assets, or something like that? Yeah, pretty much no pulse. Um, yeah. and, and so <laughs> those are alive and well. And, and another fact is, too, I just did an interview with an attorney, uh, Gannon the Cannon out of uh, Texas. Mm-hmm. He has been actually helping people uh, with the for, uh, closure process and in the forbearance process, and it's actually pretty scary if you haven't seen that um, interview, that the bank's alternative is saying, look, um, we're either gonna take your house or you have to sell it. And in most cases right now, most cases, um, uh, people, if you add up all the fees, don't have enough equity in their home yet if they bought it in the last two or three years to clear all the back payments and everything. And they say, what we'll do is we'll get you to a 40 year fixed rate at like five and a half, six percent 
And all it does is lower your payment about 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. So I, I just sort of wanted to hit on what both you guys were saying. I believe we're seeing the turn. And um, I do believe what Jack's saying. Yeah, I believe we have a few months. But what I think you probably mean, Jack, right, is uh, you have a few months until you see the evidence of a falling housing market, right? And, and it does take a few months for people to sort of go through that perception change. And I think right now with what we're seeing, and literally this is the last three or four days uh, where you're seeing all of the articles turn extremely bearish on the real estate market. So is this, um, you know, a lot of, we're starting to see some, some portion of the market is now underwater on their, on their mortgages already. And, yeah. and sort of that's what, that's what leads to it is uh, when some of these mortgage backed securities, some of the, the riskier tranches start going bad, then it can sort of trickle into the higher tranches. And then all of a sudden, all these bonds are worthless, all these uh, stacked, uh, cubed, squared, whatever. You, you, we all saw the big, the big short movie, right? Um, but it, it can lead to a cascading series of impacts with everything so hyper leveraged these days. So, but I want to change the subject or switch the subject. If we head down that path, how do gold and silver investors sort of react to this? Is this a, uh, you know, what happened? Remind, you guys remind us what happened back in 2008. Gold initially took, it tanked, right? And then it took off. What happened, Lee? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, anytime, the way I see the world right now is we're entering a, a huge liquidity crisis. Uh, you look at Bitcoin and it's just been selling off. We've had this recent, you know, jump up, but I just see the whole world is like a pool of liquidity and that pool is shrinking. And I think we're going to see every market kind of contract to some extent. The Russell 2000 has yet to kind of reach where it was. It's just been soft. I think we're going to see that start hitting the Dow, start hitting the NASDAQ. We're going to see it in the real estate sector. And in that kind of scenario, people are trying to cover losses in other areas. So they start selling off other assets, including gold and silver. So I would expect to see a little bit of softness in precious metals initially. But then there's a flight to quality and people start buying. Yeah. Or the Fed comes in and, and says, we need an emergency $3 trillion injection. And then silver, no, but if you, if you look at gold, the take off velocity of money, we're, we're at historic lows. Money's just not moving through the system. Yeah. You know? uh, Jack? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we saw it last March, right? When the, when the pandemic first hit and when the lockdowns first hit and everything was selling off, we saw gold and silver got dragged down with it. Um, and that was really my introduction to precious metals investing at that point. That's when I became so heavily uh, involved in it because, I mean, I see interest rates going down, going down. I mean, the 10 year was down to like a half a percent at one point. And I hear trillions of dollars being printed. And yet I'm seeing gold and silver going down. Silver went down as low as I think eleven dollars. And you, you do have the baby thrown out with the back with the bathwater. You have that panic sets in. Everything yeah. gets sold off. People fl flee to quality, which apparently fleeing to quality meant selling gold and buying treasuries at a half a percent yield. I don't understand that, but apparently that's what happened. Yeah, well, the 10-year also, it, it sold off pretty pretty heftily today. It uh, got as low as uh, 1.15. Uh, 1.15%. 1, 1, 1. Now, remember, that's the yields dropping yeah. right so that's the the bond prices going up so oh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a yeah. flight to quality people flight buying bonds, bonds. Yep. Yeah, people buying bonds so the yields dropping dramatically it's, and that's been you know going on since since march but since to a t the day the slr expired yeah yeah if you, if you look at that double top on, on that 10 year you were just showing yeah. one is march 18th or 19th when they announced they weren't going to extend it and then the other is the 31st when it actually expired gotcha gotcha well, guys, any, any final thoughts, Travis? You know, uh, just other than uh, in 2008, you know, we saw gold and silver sell off uh, during that, that flight to safety, but it was the paper markets. The, the metals, uh, physical metals held their value. And I believe we're going to see the same thing this time. I think in 2008, silver started at 18, bottomed at nine. And then around October 12th, started to take off on a multi-year bull run all the way to like 49 and change. Uh, I believe that we're going to see that on uh, cocaine, literally, this time. And uh, ironically, uh, a lot of it is going to be uh, due to the fact that many people have gotten together on your site, Wall Street Silver. Uh, there's so many people now 
that are into precious metals investing and understanding the difference between fiat and, and real money that, to be honest with you, I think this is going to lead to absolute fireworks. So I don't know if it's good to hold cash and to try and buy more physical because I think it's going to be pretty hard. It'll get tight real quick. Um, but it's going to be very exciting. Let's put it that way. Well, you know, back even back, I, I, I wasn't buying physical back then, but I've heard stories from those who were that, yes, the price of silver dropped on the, on the paper market, but, you know, American Silver Eagles never really fell below 18 or 19 bucks. I mean, it was exactly. like physical, physical market did not drop. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's going to be like that, but even better. Uh, I think we'll see an absolute explosion in the price of physical because inventory will get so tight. Well, we'll see a lot of people whining online saying, hey, why can't I buy it at spot, spot? <laughs> God yeah. damn. It's like, yeah. hey, you, you know, we, we have to realize that institutions will typically hold SLV and, and yeah. we know how we feel about SLV. So yeah. I, I would not be surprised to see that fall a little bit. Yes. But, you know, I, we're entering a time where if you're not holding precious metals, it's the only asset without third party risk. And we're, yeah. we're entering a world of like extreme third party risk. So yeah. it's and a time the, to buy. The final word, 30 seconds, Mr. Jack. I would uh, keep an eye on those unallocated fractional reserve schemes. I mean, if it really does come down to a liquidity crunch and we start seeing liquidations across the board, I think it's going to shine a light on, on what's going on over there. Perfect. And you will Perfect. have a flight to physical when that happens. <laughs> well, Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate it. And let's do it again sometime. You guys are awesome. Pleasure, cool. guys. Thanks, guys. Take it easy. Appreciate it.